My name is Monk Rowe, and we are filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archives. And it's our great pleasure today to have Ed Shaughnessy, one of the great engines behind some bands over the years, and probably, I would say, you're one of the most recognizable drummers in the country. Yeah, for that happens when you're on the tube for <laughs> close to 30 years, yeah. Yeah. Seen at the, I'll give you the logo, all right? Quote, seen and heard by more people than any drummer in musical history. Now, somebody else made that up, not me. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. That's, I carry that around sometimes because some press agent made that up a long time ago, you know. Think of the number of times you play. That's right. Amazing. But uh, that's, 5, only, that's only part of what you did. Oh, sure. And, uh, that was a good way to pay the rent and yeah. raise my family, quite yeah. frankly. And I still did a lot of jazz work, you know, at right. night and stuff like that. Right. Um, you and Louis Belson, a few other guys, have just kind of defined uh, modern jazz big band drumming, I think. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think that uh, we've had some influence in it. Uh, I think another fine contributor, was, and I'm sure you would agree, would be the late Mel Lewis, mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, drummer yeah. in his manner and style of playing. Right. Yeah. But I think that Louis and myself uh, both kind of have tried to move with the times because you can't play, really play big band quite the same today as you would have played it yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, not quite. And yeah. uh, I think we've both tried to move with the times and I think uh, still try to retain your own identity. Right. That's the secret. <laughs> Tell us what you're up to these days. Uh, well, since The Tonight Show ended three years ago, I'm really back to being sort of what I was a long time before The Tonight Show, and that is a freelance jazz drummer. I'm really kind of back to home base again, mm -hmm. you know, which is fine. I am enjoying it yeah. immensely. Great. And I do a lot of uh, clinic work at uh, colleges and high schools. I've been doing that for many years. Right. I like, like working with kids a lot. So uh, I do uh, really a lot of, though. I've done over 600 by now of mm. schools, you know. And uh, I'd say three out of four are colleges, and uh -huh. uh, maybe one out of four is high school. Uh -huh. But I like them both. They're fun to work with the kids, you know. The thing about kids playing music is that when they're really into it, they're really into it for the music. They're not yet near the, the big buck syndrome or anything else, you mm -hmm. know. And you find maybe a little bit later, then some of them start to smell the rock and roll money. This is later after school. And then there's a whole different thing that starts to happen with some of them. But the ones yeah. that really love jazz and want to stay in that uh, area, uh, they're the ones that I really have the most fun with. They're, yeah. Uh, yeah. They're great, great to work with. Do they, uh, is, is this, the, the idea of playing swing new to them in some cases, or have they been exposed uh, to that? Well, it uh, would really all depend on the band director. Yeah. Uh, there are some places you go where um, I would say that that's not, that skill hasn't been developed very well, and there are other places you go where it's, uh, Fair. Yeah. Fair is about the best. I spend 90% of my time trying to get people to play jazz time well. I mean, I really can't get into the complex things like odd meters or coordination <laughs> and independence when those are important mm -hmm. because most of the people aren't grooving. They're not swinging. And if they don't have that, they're really of not much value to their organization, mm -hmm. whether it be big band or small band. Right. So quite frankly, I spend a lot of time on that, but that's, it'd be like Mel Tinton sitting here talking about getting them to play good time and good changes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you don't have that on bass, yeah. you're not a good bass player. Yeah. So it's something I'm trying to help to keep alive in my own small way because uh, it, it's, uh, every once in a while it's in danger of disappearing. Hmm. Since everyone is sort of MTV um, exposed and we have so little exposure for jazz on a public medium like television, that it's nobody's fault. It's just that the kids and even the teachers, they don't have a chance to see like high class, what I call world class drummers play jazz. Mm -hmm. So they don't know how it goes. Mm. They've got a million guys, you know, flailing away playing hard rock and heavy metal, but uh, there's very little example for them. The only saving grace today, Monk, is that we have videos. And you can really live in Squeedonk yeah. in some corner yeah. of the country. And if you can afford to buy an occasional video of a good player, you will get some really good hands-on mm -hmm. stuff. You know, that's the one thing we have today that it takes the everything. place of the lack of live bands to look at. Yeah, so many of the guys have mentioned that there's not the training ground oh, that no. there used to be for... for well, for I graduated people. high school, I was 16, 
And by 17, I was on a band bus working with like grade Z bands, you know. <laughs> grade and, Z. Yeah, that we used to call it grade <laughs> Z. And you'd work your way up through the alphabet <laughs> till finally you got up to the B's and the A's and the Dorsey's and the Goodman's yeah. and Basie and Ellington. Yeah. But that's really your training ground. That's, you know, and if you were a young guy like me, uh, you always would seem to be working with most guys a little bit older than mm -hmm. you. If you were kind of a guy that got an early start like right. I did. And this was a great advantage because they played better. They were more mature as far as even the road and everything. So you had a little help from guys like that. And I always appreciated that. Guys were always good looking after the kids in the band, so to speak. Right, right. Uh, let me take you back because I heard, I, I read a story, and I like to know if these stories are true, about how you got your first drum set. Oh, my first father. drum set? Yeah, I guess you know the story. Uh, uh, my dad, who was a, a teamster, he worked on the docks, and uh, he had loaned uh, $20 to somebody, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the fellow was up against it. He couldn't give him the $20, and he said to my dad, uh, doesn't your son like music? Because at the time when I was playing piano, I played piano oh, for about yeah. three or four years before drums. And he said, uh, oh, yeah, my kid, he just loves his music. He loves everything about music. And he's a, he was a mellow guy, my dad. So the guy said, well, look, I can't give you the 20 bucks, but I've got these two drums, a bass drum and a snare drum with a stand, you know, and a little pedal, and uh, I think a beat-up old cymbal. And he said, "If would you take that in place of the 20 bucks? And like I said, my dad, being a mellow dude, mm -hmm. he was a mellow dude. He said, yeah, man, if you broke my kid, he'll probably have fun with these things, you know. <laughs> So my dad, we didn't have a car. We never had a car. He brought them home from New York on the subway oh, that went from New York to New Jersey. We didn't have a car. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I appreciated how, nice. how he did that. Yeah, yeah, I brought them home and uh, and on the bus from the subway to home, right? That's the way you did in those days. Uh, you didn't think twice about mm -hmm. it. You know, I guess they let you on with crazy things <laughs> like that. And so he, make a long story short, I'm 14. He brings these old beat-up drums in. I mean, really beat-up, old, like from the 30s or 20s or something and I can't explain it to you but something fascinating happened when I o opened them up it took me half a day to set the snare drum up on the stand right I think <laughs> and put the pedal on you know I didn't know anything about drums but uh, I had been fooling around with some uh, drumsticks that somebody had given me and I wasn't enamored of the piano I kind of liked it but I didn't love it mm -hmm. you know and I was practicing and I wasn't playing popular music I'd play the blues by myself which my piano teacher really <laughs> didn't like you know she was into da 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 right, right. and I'm playing the blues and I saw a movie that influenced me a lot you know Blues in the Night do you ever remember a movie called Blues in the Night some people have mentioned well it's that, it's yeah. uh, it's a late 30s like yeah. 39 or 40 but it's terrific because it's a jazz band movie with uh, a couple of the ex Dead End kids playing roles. And oh, that movie turned my life around. I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be one of those jazz guys mm -hmm. on the road, even though they had a terrible life in the movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was glamorous, you know? Uh -huh. uh, when they were yeah. hot, they were hot. Yeah. The music. And uh, uh, the lead character was a drummer, too. So anyway, well, these are strange ways to take up your life's instrument, I know, but it's the truth that I'm telling you. So I started fooling around on these drums down in the basement. We lived in a tenement, you know, where they have like 10 families. So uh, you couldn't play in the, in the in apartment. The yeah, so I, I would fool around. And from the minute I started fooling around with the drums, I just felt this great big love for that instrument that I'd never felt for the piano. Mm -hmm. And uh, I immediately I sought out my scout master, who was a good rudimental drummer, and uh, he started teaching me, you know. Wow. And uh, I became a madman. I was practicing, even going to school, I was practicing four to six hours a day, which means, I mean, that's a real nut. Like, that's a kid yeah. who's a nut. Yeah. But I loved every minute of it. It was like I'd really found something. And the radio played a great role in my mm -hmm. life. I would turn on all the remotes of Woody Herman, Count Basie, which are still going then. Mm -hmm. This is in the 40s. And I would play the drums with these great bands, see? Right. And uh, I mean, what better, what more inspiration could you mm -hmm. have than Basie or Woody Herman yeah. with that great first turd? I mean, it was all smoking, you know, mm -hmm. smoking. I said, ah, this is great. And he'd be down here playing on these beat up old bad drums, man. Uh -huh. But you, you know, the equipment isn't the important thing at the time. It's that feeling that you have. And I said to myself, someday I'll play with a band like this. Wow. I, I may God be my judge. I, I'm great. not varnishing it at all. Mm -hmm. It's not very glamorous sitting in an old beat up cellar playing on old beat up drums, but that is the way it started. That's and great. I often wonder now if my dad hadn't brought the drums home, 
I wonder if I would have sought out getting some drums. Mm -hmm. I was drumming with drumsticks, but I can't honestly say to you I had the ambition to be right. a drummer. Right. It was like a lot of kids. You know, kids. a lot of kids I know that I've worked with in schools, they'll start on one instrument, but they, I'm sure you know this as an educator, they'll go to two or three others before mm -hmm. they settle. Yeah. So anyway, that's my... Uh, three years later, you were out? Three years yeah. later, I was on the road playing uh, with professional bands. Right. That's a true story, yeah. George Shearing gave me my first job in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was about uh, 18, I was sitting with Bud Powell, and he played Cherokee for 25 minutes, oh, and I stayed with it. Wow. And George Shearing said, anyone who could play Cherokee at that temple for 25 minutes, I'm going to give a gig to. This is just what he said. His manager came over and said, Mr. Shearing wants to talk to you. And he says, young man, anybody can play Cherokee for 25 minutes with Bud Powell. I've got to give. A, I've got to give a job to. I thought it was so sweet the way he did it. And I said, besides, my drummer's a little hung up. You know, he said later. <laughs> so he gave me two nights. Uh, he gave me great. Yeah. Was like, that he, with John Levy? Was I was with John yeah. Levy. Yeah. Boy, you got some memory for. Well, he. We spoke This is prior to the quintet. You yeah, know? we yeah. spoke with him and. Uh, yeah, and, and then the second George. guy gave me a job was uh, uh, Jack Teagarden, uh -huh. who was another style, right? And he yeah. heard me playing uh, on Fifty Second Street. I think with George, and he came up to me and said, uh, my, my regular drummer, Maury Feld, can't make the first two nights of next week. Would, would, you, uh, would you like to work with me? I said, oh, Jack, I'd love to work with you. He said, well, you know, he says, I heard you skate in these tempos. He said, I love to play fast, but I have to have a, drum a young drummer can play fast, and you can mm -hmm. play fast. So practicing fast tempos, which I used to do a lot, yeah. Really got me a lot of my work because mm -hmm. the bebop days were you either could do this or you get run over. Mm. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. That was it. It was like you know swords were uh, prominent at one time in history, and then pistols. Well, in the bebop days, it was can you play seriously for 15 or 20 yeah, minutes this pulse and maintain it and not run out of gas. So as I explain to students even today, that's why you should practice rhythm a great deal. Mm -hmm. Most people don't practice rhythm when they're young. This sounds odd, doesn't it? If you're going to be a rhythm player, shouldn't you practice yeah, rhythm? Yeah, No, no. So. <laughs> you, you ask three or 400 drummers in an auditorium when I'm doing a big percussion convention, mm -hmm. and I'll say, how many people here sit and practice rhythm regularly? And wh what do you and mean you by that Wait, I'm doing my bit for you. Okay. Well, there's one. <laughs> you know. Well, there's two or three. This, I'm serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For well, what are they practicing? They're practicing Bench. speed and technique. Yeah. And to practicing sit, moves, man, and licks. play you're talking about. Like I'm talking play. about actual time. Yeah. So I get all of my students, they have to go out and buy one or two Oscar Peterson duo or trio records with no drums. <laughs> the time, of course, they don't need us. The time is sensational. And they have to practice with oh, that as part of the lesson, get a groove. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't practice rhythm. Mm -hmm. But when I was young, for some reason, I don't want to sound like, oh, wasn't I so smart? Mm -hmm. It seemed like common sense. Yeah. Gee, if I'm going to go to New York and try to sit in, you know, what if Bud Powell called yeah. Cherokee? Yeah. And it happened. And I had a record of Cherokee by Don Bias that was faster than anything in the mm. world. It went like this in two beat. Da, 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 da. And the drummer played it a two beat style. Do you follow uh -huh. what I mean? Yeah, sure. I played it four beat. I went ding, 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 and I would do that three or four times a day. So when Bud Powell played his Cherokee, it wasn't as fast as Don mm -hmm. Bias's Cherokee. I felt like I was on cruising speed, you know? Yeah. I always used to pity you, the drummers and the bass players, in that, those situations where the jam sessions and all the sex oh, yeah. players would line up. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. you guys would. Well, you know, what the, you know what the joke is, don't you? Among rhythm players, I'll tell you what the standard joke is. And bass players get it just as much as drummers. You're playing, right? And like four tenor players have played four or five choruses and trombone and trumpet and piano. And then you're, you're just about on your last tank of gas, and they turn around and they say, Drum solo. <laughs> well, they turn around and say, you'll hear, if I was a bass player, they say, bass solo, you know. Thanks a you'll, lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, your mama, you know. I mean, <laughs> you're so tired by now. You, don't, you couldn't care less about playing a drum solo okay? <laughs> or a bass solo. But uh, in those days, what you did do was you learned how to pace yourself. So if they did ask you to play a drum solo, quite frankly, you were able to. Yeah. It, uh, it was something you had to learn to do, you yeah. know. And of course, I was lucky. I lived in New Jersey. For 10 cents, I hopped on a subway, walked uptown 20 blocks, learned how to buy a Coke and nurse it for three or four hours in a corner of a, a joint, because I wasn't mm -hmm. of age, and stand tall, you know, look tall. Yeah. 
and watch Max Roach or watch Art Blakey. Now, don't you know, a great deal of how I learned how to do this stuff was from watching those guys. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like I invented it all yeah. in Jersey. I had role models. See, that was the advantage of living close to a big urban yeah. center like that. And right. here I had the greatest of the leading drummers to watch. Wow. I saw Kenny Clark, heard Clint and Clark, Art Blakey, Max Roach, no, more than once. I mean, quite a few times. See. Fantastic. So, and my original idol actually was Sidney Catlin, mm -hmm. who was maybe the greatest all-around jazz drummer I've ever heard because he wow. could play with anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've endeavored to do all my life. Sidney Catlin inspired me because yeah. I heard him play with Bird and Dizzy, and he took me, because he was friendly to me and, and, and kind of like a mentor, mm -hmm. and he took me across the street, and he sat in at Jimmy Ryan's across the street, and he played some traditional music, man, just like he was born wow. to just, a, just that. He still sounded like Sidney, but what he had brought to Bird and Dizzy's music, he also brought to the wow. Jimmy Ryan band. Isn't that a, a that's, wonderful gift? I guess that comes from from just listening and having huge open ears. He had or huge something. ears, and he had. I think the important thing is that you must have, you must have the desire to want to make groups sound good. See, yeah. I mean, a, a man came up to me today after a set I played and said, "I want to tell you how I think you really helped to make this group sound good." Well, that's the nicest compliment yeah. I think you could get. Mm -hmm. That's more meaningful to me than if he said, "You know, those two choruses you played on uh, I yeah. Got Rhythm were yeah. really hot." Yeah. I mean, no. I don't mean to right. put that down, it's very nice, but I'd much rather somebody say, I think you really helped to make the group sound yeah, good. Yeah, because not everybody's out to be a great accompanist. In well, you know, Milton uh, has a, have you interviewed Milton yet? Yeah. Yeah, well, he may have said his stock line, but I want to give him credit. Milton says, we perform a service, a rhythmic service. <laughs> and I mean, he's right in a way, and that's what we're supposed to be good at, yeah. you know. And you get your moments to... Yeah, you get your moments way, yeah. to do your stuff. But you're but, shining if you're doing You know, I tell some, right. so I've been at colleges where I listen to the college band play and they want me to come up and critique it. And uh, uh, I, I often say to the director now, do you want me to uh, be really blunt or do you want me to uh, couch everything and, and kind of soften it up? He said, no, I want you to be really blunt. I said, all right. <laughs> and I will say things, not cruel things. I don't, would never want to be mean. So I'd say, Rhythm, I have to tell you, each and every one of you looks like you're thinking about what kind of a pizza you're going to order while you're playing rhythm. Nobody's interested in this section in playing rhythm. Wow. And they look at me yeah. like, wow, what is this, what's this dude talking about? And I, I'll sit down at the drums and I'll say, let's play the blues. And I'll play the blues with a rather nonchalant the way the drummer plays mm -hmm. and the bass player plays. I say, okay, now there's nothing much happening. I say, let's do it again. I'll go, ba ding, 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 ding. And right away they go, oh, see, now that's, I, that's yeah. the difference. Mm -hmm. I am paying a lot of attention to really making it happen. And quite frankly, that's the way it is with some younger players. Mm -hmm. I don't mean at all, not all, but some of them have the idea that playing rhythm is what you do in between your solos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But being you're playing the rhythm 99% of yeah. the time, you yeah. might as well get interested wow. in it. Yeah, you have, to have, you have to have a pride in being a good rhythm player mm -hmm. to be a good rhythm player. Yeah. All right. You know, that kind of thing. Take us up into where you moved from the grade Z <laughs> <laughs> Well, they weren't really the great Z. I'd, I'd I say about K or L, yeah. maybe fans. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, then uh, uh, my first big break with something that really was making a little bit of noise was a band called Charlie Ventura, which was not a big band. It was uh, one of those sort of uh, nonets, you know what I mean? Uh, Ninets yeah. or whatever they call it. He had a four horn front line and three rhythm. I guess maybe we were seven. Mm -hmm. He, at that time, just after I joined him, Within a year or two, he, I don't know if you can remember a few years back, but do you remember when Chick Corea was maybe at the very peak of his popularity? Mm -hmm. I, I think you could, at that time, say he was the number one small group. Wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't you say he had oh, a yeah. period like that yeah, sure. for two or three years? I mean, yeah. every new Chick record was a big right. deal. And, well, that's the way Charlie Ventura was. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to describe it, but he was sort of the way a Chick Corea has been at his zenith. And wherever we went, everybody was listening to that band because he had these two singers, Jackie Kane and Roy Crow. Oh, yeah. And they were doing the wordless vocals, the doodle doodle right. bebop. Well, he had found a happy marriage. He called it Bop for the People. But he found a happy marriage of a good, hot bebop band mm -hmm. with the two talented kids doing these lyric, uh, non word lyrics, you know. And uh, it made for an enormous popularity with him. He sold a lot of records. 
we had standing room only wherever we would go. So since this was the first band I was with that had a real name thing, uh, it did a lot for me. It kind of put me on the map. Okay. Yeah, and we did this. I just talked to a gentleman who has a copy. We did the first uh, live concert sp uh, sponsored by Gene Norman out here that was put on an LP. Mm -hmm. All the uh, what we call wirehead guys, they're all very aware of that album. It was 1949. And it wasn't, of course, the first jazz concert put on record. Norman Grants had done that for years. Yeah. But they were a bunch of 78s that you had to keep changing. Mm -hmm. This was the first jazz concert live ever put on an LP. Wow. It's called uh, Charlie Ventura in Concert at Pasadena. And uh, I'm just telling it to you because maybe some of your listeners or viewers of this thing uh -huh. might be interested in that. Some people are very interested in that. It's a first of a kind, you know. And I hope you have a copy. Uh, it's now on CD, fortunately. Oh, Only half is. Uh, I hope they put out the other half because my drum solo is on the other <laughs> half. <laughs> but I bet you're playing great time. I'll tell you, it's pretty good for a 19-year-old. Uh -huh. It's pretty good. Yeah. We're all still 19. I mean, naturally, wow. uh, naturally, uh, there are some things that could be improved, but mm -hmm. uh, I think you always feel like that. Wow. It's a good hot band if you ever hear the record. Uh -huh. It holds up pretty good today. We had uh, very talented people uh -huh. in that band, really good people. So from there on, I moved into a lot of the bigger bands. I played with Tommy Dorsey after mm -hmm. Buddy Rich left. And uh, I did Benny Goodman's first European tour, which has never been uh, gotten much notice because the big tour to, with, to Russia by the State Department is kind of ev what everybody focused yeah, on. But yeah. his first European tour of all, would you believe that Benny Goodman had never played in Europe until uh, he took myself, Dick Hyman, who's here, and uh, Roy Eldridge and Zoot Sims. And Toots Steelman we picked up, and an English bass player named Charlie Short, and that was Benny Goodman's first appearance in Europe in 1950. I mean, never, even at the height of his popularity. Wow. You know, Louis had gone over there from the, yeah. like the late 20s, or early 30s. He was a king over there. And Benny Goodman, with as, mu as big as he was here, had never played in Europe. I couldn't figure out why. Mm. And he was hugely received over there. So that was a nice all-star uh, group to work with. I became quite friendly with uh, Roy Eldridge, and uh -huh. I was... We used to room together. Great. Uh, yeah. Did you like working with Benny? I liked working with Benny a lot because I loved, he was playing great at that time. Uh -huh. And uh, I got along with Benny, who's hard to get along with. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. uh, most people know that and don't know what instrument he plays. But uh, <laughs> yeah. when I was uh, used to sit in with Lionel Hampton's band, he said to me one night, I hear you're going with the old man. I said, yeah, I'm going to go to Europe with Benny. I was uh, 21. And he's, here's what he said to me. He said, now, if he gets weird on you, get weirder. I said, this is the key? He said, this is the key. He said, didn't I get along great with him? I, he, I said, yeah, you seem to have a good relationship with him. He said, well, just if he gets a little out, go a little outer. So when, when this happened, and uh, I was late at a rehearsal, and I walked through the thing, and he looked at me, and he put the glasses down with the famous ray. <laughs> And he started in. I said, Jesus, Benny, are we just here to jerk around or are we going to rehearse? <laughs> May God be my judge, that's what I said. I tried to go as far out as I could. <laughs> I, by hand, and he said, here's what he said. He said, the kid's right, let's play. And he never said a word. And I was over 35, 40 minutes late. And this was Paris, his biggest concert. So you oh know he was God. going to chew my thing out real good. And I did, I did a hamp. And I went out on him, and I went out. And I tell you, every, I did it one other time for, in a lesser way, and he never bothered me. I think he thought the kid is definitely crazy, but he's a nice little drummer. Leave, Leave him, alone. him alone. But he picked on everybody else. He <laughs> cut out Roy Eldridge's solos in certain places because he was getting too much applause. Yeah. He cut out Zoot Sims solos all through Scandinavia because Zoot was more popular than he was oh, there. Cause they like, I mean, God be my judge, this is the truth, I'm telling you. You know he's he was a very strange man. Yeah, I've read. But some thank God for Hamp. Hamp straightened me out. Yeah. Just go a little further, baby, and it worked like a charm. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a funny story? That's great. <laughs> yeah. I I never he never told me a thing about playing. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people said to me, You are gonna get crucified by him. You're a bebop drummer. I said, No, 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 no. I'm known as a bebop drummer, mm -hmm. but I know how to play for Benny Goodman. What yeah. do you do? You play simpler. Yeah. You play straight. I mean, do you got to be a rocket scientist? You don't play <laughs> behind Benny Goodman the way you'd play behind Bud Powell. Yeah. 
I don't understand when people think right. that. Yeah, I mean, maybe of course I came in a, out of that big Sid background and influence mm -hmm. where you try to play for the people. You don't just say, here it is, baby, you yeah. know? Yeah. So with Benny, you try, you play a little more down down the center. Mm -hmm. Look at Dick Kaiman. Dick Kaiman was playing with a lot of beboppers in New York, but when he worked with Benny Goodman, Benny Goodman was just crazy about mm -hmm. him. He says, oh man, you can play that Teddy Wilson style and you can, you know, yeah. he knew how to feed him yeah. and how to give him yeah. what he needed. The style, sure, that's part of that skill I was talking about. Right. You know. Speaking of bebop, you, you knew Parker, you knew Charlie Parker. So I had the pleasure to know Charlie Parker, yeah. yes. I thought he was a wonderful man, aside from his obvious problems. Yeah. Um, when he was uh, not under, uh, you know, you might say the control of those problems, and I never saw him like that, he was a great guy to sit and talk with because he was a mile wide. He was had one of the most expansive appreciations of, of not only music, but of life. He would say things like this. He said to me once, um, we're sitting and, and, and uh, my girlfriend was friendly with his wife. So we, you know how that works with guys? I mean, even with Charlie Parker and a young drummer, you tend to sit together quite mm -hmm. a lot because the girls are talking yeah. while you're yeah. on the bandstand and all that. And he said to me, Eddie, you've got to come uptown and have lunch they have a Hungarian string trio up at this restaurant. He said, they swing much better than any of us. I said, really? He said, oh, yes. He said, you know, so many of the ethnic musics, this is, a I mean, he used to talk like a professor, really. He said, you know, so many of the ethnic musics have got such a wonderful built-in swing. And he said, you know, we sort of get this narrow-minded thing sometimes about maybe we in jazz or all. He said, but there are a lot of people swinging all throughout the world. And I just, that might have been a big impression mm -hmm. on me. And later I studied Indian tabla drumming, uh -huh. and I found out how right he was. That stuff was cooking, too, in its own way. Yeah. You know? He had that kind of, and then he also told me to go by uh, the Rite of Spring and the Firebird. He said, because if you want to hear how meters move around, he said, the, uh, Stravinsky's the master. And don't yeah. you know I went right out yeah. and bought those two albums? I mean, that was, that was Bird to me. He was a... A mile, Just took it all in, huh? Took it all wow. in. He'd sit in and play with anybody. He didn't have any of that ego crap that mm -hmm. so many guys have who play about four licks. I mean, you know, yeah. Bird didn't have any of that. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. So I had I, I only played with him, not formally, uh, you know, uh, but uh, I think Max was sick one time, and I played uh, like a half a night with him until... Max could get there or whatever yeah. it was. And right. another time, uh, his drummer got stuck and couldn't play a show, a benefit at the Apollo. So I'd say I played with Bird maybe six times altogether, mm -hmm. but not formally, not yeah. where he called me up and all of that, right. you know. But it was, right. not, it was a great thrill, and I have yeah. one record I'm on with him. He came and sat in with us when somebody was bootlegging uh, re a recording at, uh, did you ever hear of a place called Cafe Society downtown? Yeah. Famous place, yeah. Uh, Barney Joseph's place, famous place for uh -huh. a lot of stuff. And uh, I worked there with the great guitar player Mundell Lowe a lot mm -hmm. and Tony Scott, a fine clarinetist. And Bird used to come and play with us when he was off work, mm -hmm. you know, to stay in shape. So wow. we, we got a couple of those zippy tunes. Cool. <laughs> and I'm playing four bar exchanges with Bird, which as you can imagine for, a, <laughs> for a not, not just a young drummer, but for anybody, it's a great, yeah. really a great privilege, you know, just wow. to even be able to sit and listen to yourself. Right. Play. Now your first experience moving from the the smaller groups into uh, the big band. I mean, yeah, was was that a big adjustment or? I would say that it was a fair adjustment. Yeah. Uh, nobody told me anything, but I felt like I sounded too wimpy in a big band. Mm -hmm. I'm not a strong drummer, but at that time I didn't play quite the way I could play now. And uh, well, I mean, <laughs> that's the way it is. When yeah. you're playing bebop and small stuff, strength isn't the biggest thing. I mean, you have to have strong time, but it's not quite the same as mm -hmm. big band. Big band calls for a lot more muscle. Yeah. You know, and uh, the speed and dexterity I talked about was very important in small band. So when I got in big bands, uh, I heard a record or two and a few tapes back of a couple of big bands playing. It sounded all right. I don't want to make it sound like it's not terrible, but it didn't have what I'd heard in the drumming of. Uh, of Catlett or Davy Tuff, who was an idol of mine in Woody's band, or Don Lamont, the next drummer in Woody's mm -hmm. band, Buddy Rich, who, when he wanted to play for a band, could really play for a band, you know, aside from being the brilliant soloist that he was. They had more bottom, and I realized it was that they also, they played the bass drum just a little bit more than I was playing it in bebop, because in bebop, the bass drum was almost considered to be needless. Mm -hmm. Although, I found out later, everybody played it just lightly, like I did. 
but uh, we didn't play it with very much of a firm contact. You almost just did this and then mm -hmm. played all the bombs and accents and the right cymbal carried yeah. the group. But in a big band, it doesn't work so good that way. So I started learning how to beef that up just a little bit and play the time stronger, and uh, it didn't work right away. I'd say it took me another 10 years of playing big band where I think it started to, I was about 30, I was about 35 to 40 when I think it started to sound reasonable. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not going to say it if mm -hmm. it isn't true. I mean, I was a good small band drummer uh -huh. long before that. I was pretty good at 19 right. when yeah. I made that record I told you about mm -hmm. the LP. Pretty good. But uh, I think big band drumming takes more seasoning. And I think it's like a lot of things. I think it takes a while of doing to learn how to do it. It's more how you do than what you do. Does that make sense? Um, that pulse thing and the mixture of the bass drum and the cymbal, how strong is strong that it really drives the band, but it doesn't overwhelm the band. Right. And I that think that takes a little longer to get than the other style. There's a million good small band drummers. There's not a million good big right. band drummers, nor has there ever been. Plus, you're working, trying to keep in mind the lead, right, the lead trumpet. You know, well, there's yeah, a lot, you got to, a lot of things to, to coordinate, to set up. Yeah, you got to set up things and all that. And it's like uh, working with Basie. The, the biggest compliments I think I ever had in my life was after I made the first album. I made five albums, I told you, with Basie's band. After the first album, he told me that I fit the band like a glove. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest thing anyone could have told me. I guess so, to step well, in Well, because yeah. I think the Basie band was known for good time and swing. Right. That's why, right. you know. It's not so, it goes beyond, oh, you sound good, you played good. He said, no, you fit the band like a glove. It's comfortable, it feels great. And I thought, geez, I think a lot of that stuff I've been working on is finally coming oh, together. Great. It was about the time I recorded with Basie that I felt that uh, things were starting to come together. And what, what year was that? A couple would be years. through the 60s. Yeah. I think I recorded with him over a period of about uh, four years uh, in the 60s. And most of the time it was, uh, it didn't going to sound very strange, but th thank God for Sonny Payne's marital problems. Because when Sonny Payne, his regular drummer, couldn't come into New York because his wife would throw him in jail, Basie would call me up. <laughs> and I used to say to Sonny, Jesus, Sonny, <laughs> I, you're my man, but you know these marital problems are really grooving me. And he would say, <laughs> he would say some uh, proper epithet, you know, he would say <laughs> epithet or whatever you call yeah. it. Yeah, because we were good friends, you know. Jeez. And he couldn't because she was ready to put him in the slammer for uh -huh. like ten years. So that's wow. how come it worked out that I uh, would record with Basie. He'd 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 take the charts on the road. They'd play him for three, you know, I don't know what he said, a month or two. Then they'd come into town, call me up, and I would sight read them, and we'd record them. Wow. So uh, that's when your sight reading's got to be up to par because you want to sound like you know them. I guess. And uh, well, I'd been reading so much for so many years. I think I did develop that skill pretty mm -hmm. good. And uh, I think those records sound pretty good. I love it. We got one over there for you to sign. As a oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, there was a lot of fun working with Basie. Was one of the great thrills of my life. It really yeah. was. Really was. He uh, he got a lot done with a little, very little motion. It was uh, amazing. He was mm -hmm. like a a great general who can wave one finger and things start to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and you want to hear a fun person. story? I uh, sure do. I guess you got enough time for a fun yeah. story. It'll only take a minute. We're, we come to this studio to make the first album. And the, we sit down. And uh, we had no dividers between any of the band. Basie did not like to record that way. So therefore, mm -hmm. he set the band up almost like real life, you know? It's pretty cl almost the same as you would on a stage, almost. Mm -hmm. And we start running the first uh, tune down and play it. Kind of a medium tempo tune, nothing real hot. And I'm playing and filling and doing stuff that I normally would do. And he says, I mean, th we stop and the engineer says over the thing, uh, well, uh, the producer wants to talk to you, Count. So uh, Count says, well, talk on the thing. He says, well, do you want to talk over the mic? Count says, yeah, what is it? Come on, let's get going. So the producer leans over the mic. He says, uh, uh, we think the drums should probably be about half as loud as they are. And uh, we think that, that that would be a lot better for this recording. And Basie, who very seldom does this, went, Rawr! and hit his fist on the piano. And the whole band went like, Rawr! like this. I swear to God, including me, <laughs> scared the crap out of us. He's sitting there with this yawning cap, and he goes, roar! He roared like a lion and went, bang! <laughs> Count Basie. Count huh? Basie, yeah. I mean, I found out later this is one of his rare moments because 
and he leans over to the mic. Now, after he does this, now he's Mr. Cool. He says, Mr. Shaughnessy's here because I like the way he plays in a big band. Your job is to get it all down on record. He looked at me and says, play your way. Oh, wow. And that was the last time we got a word about in five record dates to make the album, first album. Never a word came from the booth. Wow. And you know something? They got it all down yeah. okay. I didn't modify anything. But man, that's what I do. It scared the crap out of all of us. It was like, well, you know what? It's, he made the point right in the very because we we're going to make a couple of albums for yeah. this company. He made the point that this band is going to play the way it plays. Mm -hmm. We're not going to play studio style where we kind of don't play, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or we modify everything. Right. Yeah, he wants the fire. The main thing, he wants the fire, and you need a certain amount of drumming intensity and energy for that, don't you? Yeah. You can't oh, lighten up and play, let no. the band play, and you play like Mr. Wimpy, mm -hmm. it's going to sound awful, see? But boy, he sure took care of it. Man, I'm telling you, he scared the hell out of everybody. And the main thing I remember is the roar. It was like a lion, you know? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and everybody just froze, you know, just like this. Because he never did stuff like yeah, that. You know, Mr. 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 Quiet. Yeah. Great. That was good. Great experience. Yeah, I'll bet. A lot of fun. Did you ever have um, opportunity to play uh, behind Joe Williams? Mm. I played behind Joe a great deal on The Tonight Show. Yeah. Not with the Basie Band, because he right. wasn't with the Basie Band at that time. Mm, but uh, I played with Joe, or played for Joe a lot. Yeah. Because he was a very popular guest on Carson's show. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you ask Joe, I don't think uh, it's an exaggeration to say Joe could do easily four. Uh, shots a year, if not more, on the Carson show mm -hmm. for quite a few years. Yeah. So uh, we worked together a lot. Great. I'm very fond of Joe. He's a great guy. Yeah. Wonderful person. Uh huh. Yeah. What were some of your? Uh, I don't want to belabor the Tonight Show thing. Is there a, a few? I think we're staying away from it pretty good so <laughs> yeah, far. <laughs> give, give me one uh, one thing about the Tonight Show, good or bad. I mean, uh, I'll give you something good. I'd say that. Uh, that Doc Severinsen tried to maintain a standard with that band just as high from the first week he became the leader as to the very last week. And it never slacked off, ever, ever. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for that because everything comes from the leader. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Shoddy playing comes from a leader that doesn't care. Right on top of it playing, that was really there and popping and good energy yeah. and good spirit comes because you've got a leader like that who insists on it. And even though I think you should always play like that, I give Doc full credit for the fact that he made sure 16 people always were like that. Now, I don't mean to paint him like a pain. He wasn't a pain. He just wanted a high yeah. class standard of performance. Mm -hmm. And because he practices two to three hours a day, and because he's always there, there's not one guy in the band that could say, yeah, but you don't really work at it. Because not probably nobody in the band works as hard as he mm -hmm. does at his horn, see? Yeah. So I give him a lot of credit for that, and I think it's why people are constantly coming up, including today, and telling me how much they miss the band on, yeah, on uh, TV. Because I think it, it, it really locked in an image of a high-class, great powerhouse big band. And I'm glad we did, because we were kind of the only thing a lot of people could listen to other than the rock and roll kind of combos that are right. on most of the other shows. The only you downside know? is that most of us just got to hear the, the ins and outs. Yeah, except, you know Let's that people, uh, did, did you ever hear that people who had dishes, uh, they heard every m bit of music we played? They When you had a dish through the Carson years, if you had a satellite dish, you didn't get local feed. You didn't oh. get any of the commercials. Oh, no so kidding. I know people have like yards and yards of tape of oh, us God. playing. Sometimes we play four and a half minutes straight on through. Mm -hmm. We'd not only play the whole chart, we'd go back to the <laughs> DS sign, you know, yeah. and actually play the whole chart. And a lot of people have made tapes of the band yeah. like that. But you're right, you didn't hear a lot. But we played quite a bit of music to keep the uh, audience jumping. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful band to play with. Yeah. Mostly, like I said, because Doc kept a high standard, yeah. you know. He really did. And I always have gotten along good with Doc because of that, because I think that's the way you're supposed to play. Right. You, know, you know, our saying was, you know, you're either going to play good or get the hell out, yeah. but don't be here. You've done some composing, too. A little right? bit. A little bit. Yeah. Did that come from piano? Uh, the Yeah, yeah. I, as I said, uh, I didn't really love the piano. I learned to like the piano more later after I was uh, a professional drummer. I started taking uh, 
uh, arranging lessons mm -hmm. with a great guy in New York named Hall Overton who did those uh, Thelonious Monk transcriptions. Did you ever hear any of that stuff? Yeah. Famous town hall concert. He would kind of was a, uh, very well known for that, but he was a fine, fine composer and a mm -hmm. great teacher. And yeah, I studied some uh, arranging and writing. It's something I never followed through on a whole lot because I always was so busy as a player, yeah. which is a poor excuse, but that's kind of what it was. Mm -hmm. Great. I might get back to a little bit more. It's a lot of fun. I remember the first time I wrote an arrangement for just a, you know, a small band with three or four horns. Uh, I didn't think it was very good at all, and yet it they said it didn't sound so bad and it's a big kick to hear yeah, sure those, is. those notes stuff. i'm sure you know what i mean to hear the notes come alive it's and you got to hear it so you can fix it the next time exactly you know? <laughs> yeah that's, that's right sometimes the hard yeah. part about writing yeah great it's good for you well this has been fascinating oh thank have, you uh, I've, I've enjoyed it thank you it's very nice uh, to be part of your uh, all project you, all you drummers out there remember that thing about practicing rhythm yeah, that's right. If you're going to be a good rhythm player, it's a really good idea to practice some rhythm. Yeah, get good. You know what I tell my students? I'm going to teach you to be a rhythm expert who plays the drums. Oh. And uh, hopefully a good musician. Yeah. You know, I mean, those two things. But that's really what it's about. And if, if you're out there propagating, uh, especially about jazz, uh, I think you should talk about the important things. I really do. All right. Oh. Well, on behalf of uh, Hamilton Jazz archive. We'd like to thank Ed Shaughnessy for his time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. He's on his way to play another set. Yep. I got time and to have supper and <laughs> play the last 1030 set. That's All my right. last one. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. you. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you.